Alex, I have a question. Um, again, going back to, I, I raised this once before. What do you do for the callbacks? How you, how do you keep how do you keep alert of your callbacks? Like we have so many different leads coming in from so many different sources, right? Wait, do you have a central place where you have all your callbacks and you keep a, a list of, of who is out there and who may potentially want certain uh, product? Because that's one of the things that I'm having, problem I'm having with sales is we have go high level. We have all these different ways of, of capturing leads and it seems to be I'll look and I'll see, oh, man, I was supposed to call this person back yesterday. So you have like a central area where you put all your leads? It's a great question, dude. I think everyone, I've not really endorsed any one central CRM system to track your progress as far as um, your sales leads. Um, the, the NAA leads, the NAA CRM is really more of a client CRM, not, not very good on the um, lead CRM side. Um, there, you know, if you do have to go high level, there's a company that'll charge you 50 bucks a month to do their go high level system where they have everything already pre-programmed and automated for you to start bringing leads in. And then they automate how you follow up with them. And um, it ends up kind of being your calendar. Like, as you guys know, my calendar is now really funnels through go high level, the go high level system. And um, because I've had to really unify some method my calendar. So all I could suggest, because everyone has a different way of doing it. Um, here's, here's probably the, the, the way that I use my calendar. Again, I'm not saying this is the best way. There are better ways than what I've always done. But when I've had a follow-up with a client, I'll book it in my calendar. Like It's like my calendar is my to-do list, OK? So. If I've got to follow up with a client, I know I've got to do it. Whether they know I'm calling them or not, I'll book a five minute phone call in my calendar, or it can be 15 minutes, whatever, as a reminder that I got to do it. So it pops up on my calendar. And so it keeps me disciplined. So it's like book a meeting from a meeting. It's our, it's our standard uh, mantra is book a meeting from the meeting, right? You don't ever want to get off the phone with someone without having another appointment put in place with them. Now, short of doing that, where they're not wanting to agree to a hard appointment, and you know you've got to follow up with them, then I would just stick it in my calendar. And Because if I put it on my calendar, I will always do what's on my calendar. If I put the information on following up with someone on a piece of paper, it won't get done. Like I promise you, it won't get done. Or I'll remember to do that. I will always forget to do it. The only way I don't forget to do something is if I schedule that call, that activity on my calendar. So I always have it right here. It's always going to pop up as a reminder. That is the way that I capture everything. Like anything that's important to me that I got to do, I'll put it in there. Even if it's a reminder, if it's a to-do, I'll put all my to-dos, I'll schedule it in my calendar, right? But the one thing about scheduling is you got to prioritize prime time versus not prime time. So what is prime time? Prime time is when you could be calling, making appointments or booking or running appointments, right? To me, that's prime time. So I try to keep my prime time sacred and all my little to-dos I schedule outside of prime time, okay? Um, they say that the most efficient schedulers are people that book their time in increments of 15 minutes. So they say all the rich people book their times in 15 minute increments. So a half hour meeting is two 15 minute increments, okay? You see what I'm saying? So the granularity of what um, super efficient, high productive people the granularity is 15 minute blocks. So you can get stuff done in 15 minutes and then you're off to your next 15 minute block. Then you need to take a 15 minute break, schedule your break in your calendar 15 minutes, 15 minute blocks. You know, So 
that's to me short of any other system like like if you don't have go high level to follow up with the client in an automated way then they can book into your calendar or some of the automated CRM type systems out there you yourself booking in your calendar as soon as you remember or as soon as you intend to do it that's Dude, that's the only way I've been able to make sure I capture everything I need to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, when def, definitely. I'm definitely, I like that 15 minute thing. I noticed, Um, so, you know, when you get to where you have, where you're supposed to call somebody back, say today at 12, right? They don't answer. Then I guess on a calendar, you just move it to tomorrow. Move it. Yes, move it, baby. Move it. That's, I, I started doing that a little bit. And I just noticed that, man, my calendar is like, I look at it in the morning, I'm like, damn, like all on the, on the top one, right? Where it's just like task, it goes down for the whole day. Yeah, right. So, um, and by the way, the stuff in my calendar is not just business stuff. I put everything in there. Like I've got my church time, prayer time. Like you cannot get a hold of me until 10 a.m. Because I'm usually in church at seven by, or eight, by eight o'clock. Mass starts at 8.30, so praying, and then mass ends at nine. And then I stay for another half hour, 45 minutes, again, praying. And then the first appointment I have is 10 a.m. And um, so, you know, I um, also have my evening prayers in my calendar. Um, Anything I have to do with my family is already in my calendar. Like I schedule everything I do because my time is my time. It's just me, right? I schedule my entire time based on all my priorities in my life. You know, I put my God time in there, my family time, and then my business time. And my calendar encompasses everything I do. So if it's important enough to do, it's important enough to be in my calendar. That's why I do not have a guilt. I don't feel guilty about a calendar because I know that when I'm doing my prayer time, it's already been booked. I'm not going to do anything else. If I'm working, I'm not worrying about praying because I already took care of that. I'm working, right? Um, I mean, seriously, it prioritizing your life according to your values and then scheduling those things you value, starting with the things you value the most, right? In descending order and making sure that your spouse knows your calendar too. Like my, my wife and my staff, they have access to my calendar. They can book anything in there they I need to do. And they know that when it's in there, I'll do it, right? I'm just, the calendar is what I live my life by. So if I live my life on my calendar, why not put everything I need to do? It doesn't make sense to me to have a business calendar and a personal calendar and all these different calendars. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? I might color code stuff, but you gotta be careful because if you have multiple calendars, problem is when you're trying to book your business calendar to go high level, it only uses one of your calendars. And so it could easily book over family time that you have on another calendar that's color coded. And then all of a sudden, you know, so that's why I have a master calendar as my Google calendar. Everything in there is using the same calendar. So if Go High Level looks at my calendar, it knows that it can't book me before 10 a.m. in the morning because I'm in church, right? So, so you gotta be careful having multiple calendars. Uh, so if you use a CRM that's hooked into it, okay? But honestly, man, if it's worth doing, then it's worth booking. And I, I tell you what, I lived my life by that for years and years. And it's worked very well for me without having a CRM. My CRM is my calendar. I like my CRM is my CRM. I mean, my go high level, okay? But, you know, my calendar is my calendar. It's everything I do in it. Right. So does that make sense, everybody? Yes. And when you're in your go high level, right, when you want to book a task, 
I noticed I can't find a way to make it go onto my calendar. Is there a way to make your task appear on your calendar through Go High Level, or do you have to go to Go High Level to see your task every day? That's a, that's a great question. I have no idea how to use tasks in Go High Level. Um, just, just because I don't have, like I know go, Google, or some of these, like Outlook has a task list that you, know, that you can keep, right? And it, what, here's what I found, my, and I'm not good at having a to-do list, right? Because what happens? To-do lists start, like I didn't get it done, and then it goes to the next day, and then goes to the next day, and it goes to the next day, and then I haven't really used it properly because I haven't, you know, like you know, I used to use the, the Franklin Planner, and they say you have A tasks, B tasks, and C tasks, and you got to get all your A tasks done before the end of the day. It's like, golly, man, I, I just never, because then my problem was trying to really do an A task. So I would fake designating a task as an A task, which really didn't matter if I did it by the end of the day. And I'd roll it to an A task tomorrow. You see how? Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. It doesn't work like that. So that's why if it's important enough to do, I'm going to schedule my time to do it and I'm going to do it. Like, I, I had to follow up with a client. And so I put that 15 minute call block in my calendar because I know I'm going to do it. And if actually I follow with a client with under, with one of the carriers. So it caused me to call the carrier at that point in time and take care of that call. If I put that on a task list, it's like, I'll look at it. It's like, ah, I'm busy now. Ah, I can't get to it until later. And then. I forget to do it, and then it gets rolled to the next day. It's just, I don't know, man. It, I, I'm just not good at doing that. So I have I'm the same that. problem. So you, task, you basically task, all your tasks have a time attached to them. Yes, I put it in my calendar, honestly. Right. And That's awesome. That's a great idea. It's amazing what you can get done in 15 minutes. Like, you know, coaching calls. Gang, it doesn't take half an hour. If a coach call ever took half an hour, then I should be coaching multiple agents. If I'm teaching you for half an hour, I need to be talking to multiple agents. I'm not a good leader if I'm spending half an hour with you on the phone. Okay. Um, coaching calls, 15 minutes at the most, honestly. Yeah. Um, it's more get your mind right calls. That's really kind of how I look at those kind of meetings. And, you know, I can get your mind right in 15 minutes. Like I said, if it's longer than 15 minutes, I should be coaching a whole bunch of people on whatever subject we're talking about. And I'm not doing a good enough job at, you know, finding those times where I can set up that subject on a call. And you guys know over the, you know, last, over the years, if you've been with me, I'll do ad hoc coaching calls. I'll do, hey gang, I'm just doing a real quick call on how to run an IUL illustration with FNG Live. I've done that numerous times. Because an agent needs to know how to do it. And it's like, well, why not show everybody? You know, they actually, I get a bunch of people on there. They see me do it for someone. Guess what? I taught a whole bunch of people. Time efficiency with training, right? One-on-one -on -one training, it's really more getting your mind right. If I have to do training one-on-one, -on -one, I need to do multiple people. So that's, that's why these kind of opportunities, you guys ask me questions. So this is a great topic, John. So John could have called me up and set up a coaching session where I could be talking about this with him one-on-one, -on -one, but he was smart and he's given me an opportunity to teach all of you how to handle your calendar to me in the quickest manner without being too technical. Okay. So that's why I love when people ask these type of questions. Well, thanks, Alex. That actually, that walking away from this meeting to now take my task time to each of them is uh them that that who knows what that could do but that's excellent excellent i appreciate that worth the price of admission <laughs> yeah worth the price of, hey you want to know something man i look yeah. at it this way you know how i respect you right anytime you say you have questions i have a couple of questions in my pocket like that you know what i mean if i'm never getting in front of you and i'd ask you saying you have a question, me not asking a question, man. I want to. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Another, uh, 
You know, I appreciate that. I mean, more than you know, that kind of mentality is you know, something when you respect your opponent's time, because then you would want people to respect your time, right? Like, that's how the whole building an agency thing works. And uh, But it does not mean you can't call me, you can't, you know, I, I welcome that. I really do. I welcome opportunities to, to catch up with you and, you know, what you need from me, you know. And the, the other thing, too, that's difficult is, is that um, I'm not worthy. So the, the I'm not worthy mentality of, well, I haven't done anything. So I really have not earned the time that it's like, oh, come on, man. Now, don't don't use that. Like you can you can get a hold of me, please, whenever something's bothering you. And because you haven't done anything is the exact reason why you should contact me. How? Because I want to get you moving. Right. So. So it's real important to me to do that. So I don't want you to think I'm not, I haven't done it. I'll wait till I do something. It's like, dude, you're not, you're not going to do anything until you call me and then we can clear away the crap in your head. Right. So I really do. <laughs> Stephanie. So Stephanie just gave me an amen to what I just said on. I know multiple calendars can really mess you up, man, because everything gets booked over each other. It's like, golly, that's impossible. So anyway, great topic. I love talking to calendar. <laughs> the thing about calendar scheduling is, um, here, here's a great way to put it. If, if I were a, a private investigator, I followed you around and I watched everything you did and I had like your cell phone mirrored on mine, I can watch what you're doing on your cell phone and your computer. Can I convict you that the things you value in your life are the things you really value in your life, right? This calendar planning is should be a reflection of what you value in your life. Like if you tell me that you value supporting your family financially, but, you're, but I see on your calendar that you've only booked two hours worth of dialing, then I, I can't see that that is true, right? I don't see that you value that because I don't see you putting it a priority in your life. Now, one thing to be careful about when it comes to that is priority does not equate to time. So if God is my, per, my number one priority in my life, it doesn't mean that out of 168 weeks, I have to do 50% of my time has to be God. You know, 25% of my time is my family. The other 25% is my business. It doesn't work like that. It comes down to priority. Okay, so priority is the things that you put in your calendar first before you put anything else in your calendar. That's what priority is. And so I'll book my God time. And typically it's like non-prime time. I mean, you could say that 8.30 mass is prime time. You know, I could do 6.30, you know, but I usually go to bed about 3, 4 a.m. So 6.30 mass doesn't work real well for me. So 8.30 works. So I found a time that works effectively for me, but I'll put that time in there. I'll put my evening prayer time and it really helps because I put my prayers in my calendar too. So like I've got my set of prayers that I do all in my calendar and I have it every day. And so I've got my God time like totally laid out, like in detail, honestly, in detail. And then my family time. So what am I doing with my family? Like Jenny knows she needs to tell me or she'll book those times on my calendar for my kids and time with her and, whatever, and then we lay that in. So you see how I prioritize God by putting God time on my calendar first, then I lay in my family time. And then for me, I don't, I don't have anything else because my hobbies are playing praise and worship music in my church. So I got two services that I do. And then I have to schedule planning time because I plan one or two masses for music a month. So I have, I'll put in planning time, which would be non-prime time, so like maybe 10.30 to, uh, maybe 10.30 to 11.30 p.m., 
I'll plan for that mass for the week, which means I'll also rehearse. You know, and maybe Saturday after church, I'll, I'll put an hour of rehearsing, you know, practicing for mass, like a, as part of my God time. But that, so that is really kind of my hobby time. Like, what do you like to do to have fun? That to me is fun. Okay. So it's kind of convenient for me that the stuff I love to do that relaxes me and that makes me feel whole and regenerates me is God time too. It's just for me, right? So the rest of the white in my calendar, meaning there's nothing going on, is my business time. And those are my business opportunities for me to book my calendar, to book talking to agents, to do all my little business things, which are not little. And I lay them in my calendar. So you see how I want my calendar to reflect what I value in my life because I want to have an effective life. I want to have an effective life that means something to God, means something to my family, and means something to my business. I want it to reflect what I value. And if I can get my schedule to reflect what I value, then I'm doing what I value. And guess what? I'm a happier person when I do those things that I value, right? That's probably the biggest problem with a lot of people is the guilt, the calendar guilt, where you feel like when you're with your family, you feel guilty because you think you should be in your business. And when you're in a business, you feel guilty because you think you should be doing your family time. I believe in guilt-free scheduling, which means does your schedule reflect your values? Because if we can start working closer to what we value in life, man, we're going to have much happier people much happier lives, and probably doing what God wants us to do, right? Doing the mission that God wants us to do, which does not divorce the other things from God time, right? So kind of when I look at it, as far as my life, God, family, and business, it's really interrelated. It's that pyramid, interrelated, that what I do for my business and my family is serving God right? What I'm doing for my business is serving my family and God. What I'm doing for my family is serving my business and God, right? Because I want to serve my family by being an example for you that, you know, I talk at family stuff here lots of times, how I raise my kids and, you know, it might serve you with helping you. Like this whole schedule discussion might help you with your family. Maybe I touched on something that could help you to me, that's a God thing too, right? Because talking about my family, what I do with my family, my, serves my God, serves the Lord, and serves you. So I look at them not being a mutually exclusive priority system. I look at it as, as an interrelated synergistic priority system in my life. So when I'm doing me, when I'm doing Alex Avian's schedule, I'm doing all three of those things. So that help you understand how this, 61 year old brain works and it took me a long time to get here like trust me it did not happen overnight and i wish i knew this back when i was in my 20s because i would have lived a much more fulfilling productive life but you know what you learn it when you learn it right and so now thank god i've got time to implement it so that i'm more effective and i do more of my mission that god has me on this earth for so that by the end of my life I was freezing early today, man. Isn't it weird? Like church, it was warmer outside than church. I was freezing in church. I go outside, it's like, oh my gosh, it's warmer out here. So I'm still trying to get over my chill. Anyway, so fulfillment. Okay, now, now I'm starting to get into kind of a bigger reality here. Is fulfillment, in my opinion, is doing what God wants you to do. And doing it to the best in, of your ability, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think that's fulfillment. I think when you're fulfilled, then you achieve happiness. Now, whenever I tried to find happiness in my life, chasing happiness for happiness sake, I never was happy. You know, because I thought material things would give me happiness. It did not. Because when I got that material thing, I wanted more. It like would not satiate the desire to obtain things. 
And I was obtaining things more out of vanity of how it would make me look to other people as opposed to obtaining things just for you know, the utility of it, right? The utility, the usefulness of it in my life, right? Um, I never was happy um, chasing relationships that was not good, <laughs> right? I wasn't good. I wasn't happy. You know, I'd have the most beautiful woman in the room on my arm. And I didn't have a relationship with her. I just had her on my arm because she was like my Rolex. It's like, yeah, that's very shallow. I know. I was, I've been there, man, in the 80s in California. You know, the 80s. Some of you old farts like me, you know, the 80s. it's better to look good than to feel good, right? I was all about that, man. It was not good. Not happy. And so, you know, when when I started realizing living a purpose-driven life, looking for fulfillment of a mission. Yeah, you know, some of you military guys know what I'm talking about. When you fulfill a mission, and it feels good. I mean, it really feels good. Like, okay, give me the next mission. You know, it's like what God's mission is. Give me the next mission, Lord. I, I gotta, I gotta conquer this thing. Right? I've got a long-term mission, man. I gotta bring souls closer to you. So let's rock. Let's do that through my work, through my family, whatever the case is. That's when I was happy. Is when everything aligned for me with my purpose. When you think about the unhappiest times in your life, is when there's incongruency, and you might even not even you feel it. You don't know where it's coming from, right? And if you ever really like sat down and meditated on it in church, good place, right? Um, and just meditate, meditate in prayer, you realize that the things you're doing is not congruent with what your purpose ought to be with, you know, serving God. Maybe it's fear and doubt. It's worry. It's not focusing on the things that you can do to move forward in your life. And you're, working, you're thinking about things of the past, failures. If you're inundated with, I should have, I should have done this, I should have been this for that person. You know, instead of moving forward in your life and cross, you know, drawing the line and leaving everything in your rearview mirror and forging ahead, because what you did was you learned from all those things and you move forward. So, you know, think about the incongruency. Like if you, if right now. What's your purpose? Yeah. Now you might be struggling. Like, did I know what my purpose was when I was younger? I did not. I did not. But through prayer and through work, it just started, you know, the guard guardrails kind of came up in my life through prayer, through work, prayer, prayer. <laughs> All of a sudden the mission became clear to me. If not the specific mission, the things that I need to work on myself to be able to fulfill a mission. But I had to work on me so many ways. So sometimes you got to be in prepared preparation mode. Are you being prepared for what God has planned for you? How do you prepare? Books, getting into the books. We have a lot of great books self-improvement books, getting your mind right books, techniques to become more focused in your life. Those things help define what your purpose is because you're being equipped to fulfill a purpose. God doesn't give you a mission without equipping you. And so I've like looked at it the, the opposite way. I got to equip myself so that when I hear the thing, I'm ready to do the thing, right? When, you know, when the student is ready, the master appears. And so what I look a lot about me is that I'm the master that appears for you that suddenly gets the, the um, discernment that, you know what, this insurance thing is what I really need to do. 
and not just for the money, but for the mission and the purpose it drives me for. Look, you don't work. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's biblical, right? So why not let your work be your offering to God and let your work um, inform your spiritual life, right? Like, and let your spiritual life inform your work, right? They're interrelated. That you don't get stuck on, man, these people hate me. No one wants to book an appointment with me. When you look at your work as part of your mission, look, missions are supposed to be hard. Missions are not supposed to be easy, okay? That's why they call it a mission, right? All you military guys know what I'm talking about, a mission. And so you gotta stay on task, you gotta stay focused to fulfill the mission. It's hard, it's supposed to be hard. So when you understand that what you're doing is to fulfill your mission, then all the crap you go through is what you're supposed to go through, right? It is, here's a, here's a really good word for you. It's sanctifying. Your work sanctifies you. What is sanctification? It really helps you achieve a level of holiness, right? People, okay, so holiness is another way, it's the, the spiritual way of saying better version of yourself, okay? So Matthew Kelly talks about better version of yourself. Matthew Kelly is a mega um, spiritual teacher, but he's got this fantastic business cons consultancy, okay? And he's and when you he, when he's talking consultancy business, he talks about being a better version of yourself. What that really means is sanctification, becoming holy er right? Achieving sanctification is a better version of yourself. So let's talk better version of yourself, right? To become a better version of yourself so you can serve your clients the best and that you're the only one that can serve the best because you care enough about them, right? And when God sees that you care enough about your clients to go through the crap, to find the right one, the good one, the one that you protect your families and you help them with their the, with the stuff they need, guess what? You just fulfilled a mission. And is it okay to make some money? Is it okay to, to support your family? It is okay. God blesses us with so many blessings. The income is a blessing. It's a form of blessing that shows the value that we added to another person. See, so when you start thinking about your work and this business in those terms, going out there getting beat up to find the right family that you're helping and you come home, your head hits the pillow at night, feeling like you did something good today to help someone's life become better. And you know what? God's smiling on you saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you are faithful in little things, tomorrow I'm going to bless you with more things. Now you might think, oh, he's going to bless you with more sales. Not necessarily. He's going to bless you with opportunities to learn and grow. So you become better, more of a warrior. So embrace the stuff that you learn from because the stuff you learn from will make you better. And then you'll be blessed with more, more opportunities to become a better version of yourself. When you look at our top producers, when you really dissect their heart and open it up, inside it, you're going to find agents that love their clients. They care about them. They will tell you everything about their children. Like Megan Wood, honestly. Megan Wood is all about being friends with her clients. She loves her clients. When she was uh, a server and bartender at Applebee's, she called her customers clients. They weren't just customers, they were family. She would know what they ordered all the time. She would get the order started. If it was a drink order, she knew what drink order they, she was one of those kind of people, those servers. And see, having that mentality in the restaurant industry, having that skill only paid her under 40,000 a year. But when she took that skill set and translated to insurance, this year she'll make $650,000. And she's got like, she clarified it, she has $270,000 in the bank, okay? She bought a $600,000 home, paid cash for a $100,000 pool. 
skill set got moved to a different, you see, you think God had a plan for her? You think God had a plan for her when she was going through eating disorder? You think God had a plan for her when she was going through drug addiction? You think God had a plan for her? Absolutely had a plan for her. She got through all that crap, stayed faithful, was making right under 40000 because she loved and cared about her clients. God said, you know what, Megan? You are ready, girl, to fulfill your mission over here in this insurance business because you're going to help so many more people out more effectively. And I'm going to bless you tremendously. Moved over here. She wasn't a success right away. Isn't that interesting? She was not a success right away. She went through her struggles. She went through, but she became better, a better version of herself. Again, here, sanctification, right? Through her work, sanctification became better and better and better. All of a sudden, she's like a beast now, right? Maybe that's what's happening for you. Maybe you're coming over here and you're thinking you're struggling. Man, you're not struggling. You're learning your lessons. You're getting, you're, you're getting through the learning curve like I had to go through, like all the top people had to go through. But are you getting coaching from me? Are you plugging into the conference calls? Are you Zoom calls? Are you taking advantage of all the opportunities? Are you coming to national conference? How can that help you? Here's what I know. All I know is that people that come to conferences become a better version of themselves. They become better. They think differently. They get more focused on what fulfills them. They see the business for what it is. God blesses them with a bigger vision than they ever thought they had before. And by having that bigger vision, it hones in on their mission and purpose. And by having that vision for their mission and purpose, they know what they need to do. That's how do I go about getting there? That's why you call me, Alex, how do I get, how do I fulfill my mission? Guess what you need to do? You need to pray, you need to work. You need to work, you need to pray. You need to call me all the time. You need to pray, you need to work. <laughs> You're not going to hear anything different from me. I mean, look, I, I want to be sensitive to what you believe in. If you're not down with that, then that's okay. I will help you regardless, okay? So don't, you know, don't take offense, please. I'm just here to provide some guidance while I'm still left here on earth, man. I'm 61, who knows? I'm closer to the end than the beginning. I got started in the insurance at 39, and um, I've learned so much, <laughs> and I'm still learning. So I'm not that, you know, that... Um, sensei at the top of the mountain with gray hair and that long Chinese beard, you know, in robes. That's not me, man. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still looking for opportunities. I spent half an hour with Andy Albright on the phone to get my mind right after the integrity marketing group. So I still need it. Never trust someone who's coaching you who is not being coached by someone better than him. <laughs> I'm just telling you, man, you go to someone and you know they're not being coached by anyone else better than him. And I would, I don't know that I'd listen to him. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, wow, that came out of a simple question, John Fignano. <laughs> I hope that made sense. I hope you're not offended. I don't mean to offend you. I mean to fire you up. I mean to help you achieve sanctification. <laughs> it's a big word just a better version of yourself man if we can get one percent better every day the compounding factor alone will blow your mind there's this great book oh my gosh it's in my special stash man. Ah, ha, ha, ha. wow there's got to be a reason why this book i found immediately Okay, this book, The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. You can see I've got like marks in here. This book is really talking about the compounding factor of um, incremental improvement. 
Oh, this is so good. I might have to read this again. This is so good. Power of the penny, right? Penny compact that doubles every day. This is really that concept, but he goes into a lot of detail. Uh, mastering your life. The slight edge. See, I think, you know, some of the key points in here is that we think that we're so far away from ultimately being really good at whatever it is we choose to do to be good at, you know, or you, you, there's discouragement, discouragement and not seeing immediate improvement. Like we all want it tomorrow. It's our microwave society that we live in, right? That we want it now, okay? We want it now. When in reality, the most important things in our life is something worth working for and worth waiting for worth uh, suffering for, worth earning, like earning, that by the time you obtain it, it's like, it's so fulfilling. Like I was telling someone about how we raised our kids. This was last week. I told them, we, oh yeah, this guy in the airport, I was in Dallas airport, I was talking to this guy and he said he lived in Southern Orange County, California. I go, what's the difference between Southern Orange County and Orange County? He goes, well, Southern Orange County, let me tell you what happens. When their kids turn 16, they get either a car or they get breast augmentation. I thought he was getting ready to tell me a joke. I go, what? He goes, yeah, you know the, the housewives of Orange County and all this, he goes, really, they're the housewives of Southern Orange County to indicate that these are exclusive places to live. I go, wow, that's kind of, he goes, yeah, it's screwed up like big time. I go, okay, well, thank you. My mind will go, thank you for acknowledging that. You know, when you turn 16, you get a car or get breast augmentation. So messed up. So I said, well, I had a very simple rule with my children. We never gave my children any gifts except for their birthday and Christmas. That's the only time they would expect to receive anything from us in terms of a gift, their birthday and Christmas. And what anything else that they wanted, they had to work for. They had to work for it. They had to save, they had to work for it. And some of my kids wanted laptops, they wanted, they saved, they did extra work beyond their chores, because chores was minimum wage. Chores kept them in the house and eating food. Okay. Chores was minimum wage in our household. Chores was not, we didn't give them an allowance for doing what to contribute to the family. Imagine that, giving our kids an allowance for contributing to the family. What? No, you don't get an allowance for contributing to the family. You're taking the garbage out because it's your turn to gather. And then we had other kids that took the garbage to the curb. It's your turn to clean the bathroom. This is family maintenance stuff. You don't get paid any extra for that. But anything that they did extra beyond their chores was something we would pay for. And, you know, all the extra stuff. Trust me, you know, honey-do lists, all the extra stuff that I didn't want to do because I had a business to build. They are more than happy to do it. My kids bought some expensive stuff because they learned the power of work. They learn to delay their gratification. Nothing was instant, but you know, when they obtained that thing, they appreciated all the work and the savings it took to obtain it. Now my son, who's like real, my oldest son, the one going to the Air Force. So check this out. He makes smart business decisions, smart financial decisions. So he's putting, 5,000 a year into his IUL. It's got 800,000 in death benefit. Thank God he got that death benefit prior to him going to the Air Force. Because the Air Force would look at him differently being a fighter pilot, right? So I said, dude, I don't know, man, but I think if you want to get into a retirement planning mode, this is a good program for you. So you've got 800,000 in IUL. He's putting 5,000 a year in it, and he's going to up it. Right now, as it stands, He'll make about a million dollars of tax-free when he retires. Million dollars tax-free. To me, that rocks. But he made that decision on his own. I presented him his options. See, this is 
the type of child we raised because we didn't give them anything except for their birthday and Christmas. And here's the deal. What we did, what we raised grateful children. Now you all been around ungrateful kids that expect to a gift every time or you come home and they, no man, we were, our kids are grateful. They're grateful for anything that we do for them. It's incredible. Like, you know, all the stuff that we go out of our way to do for them. Well, my kids are super grateful. And I'm going, wow, that's pretty cool. Because I am grateful to Andy Albright. I'm grateful for God for giving us the opportunity. My kids know how grateful I am. Nothing is given to me. Everything I've earned, and I'm grateful for it. When I'm given the opportunity, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Now it's my job to work it so I can yield the fruits from it. That's what I always taught them. I always taught them to appreciate what's been given to them in terms of opportunity, to be grateful. And then when they're able to work for something and obtain it because they put the work in, they get that mission accomplished. What's the next thing I need to work for? Does that make sense? So I think, you know, why do I tell you that? Well, I, I think if you start thinking more like that, that there is sanctification in work, right? Work and failure is a way to become better, to reframe the idea of failure as an opportunity to learn a lesson so that you can continue on. And how many people need therapists to get them, get their minds right? When all that failure and all that pain and hurt in their lives was a way to become better, a way to learn how to be better, learn coping tools to handle failure. That's one thing we taught our children is to look at failure as an opportunity to learn so they're not scarred by failure. <laughs> they put in the proper context in their lives as a way to learn and become better. Right? So, I'm not giving you parenting advice. I'm just giving you, telling you how we raised our kids. It seems to have worked. And I think that if you kind of take that on for yourself and look at this business as an opportunity, your opportunity to be grateful for it and to put the work in to get the fruits from it, right? And all the failures, getting hung up on, getting no-showed, et cetera, is an opportunity to learn how to get better. When you get your coaching, when you talk to me, you meet the top producers at national conference, it's a tremendous opportunity that I think we all should be grateful for is to get around the people, fellowship with the people that are where in life that we want to be in terms of their production. You know, maybe they got their act together, want to know how husband and wife can do this business together, right? Whatever that is. So I really endorse coming out to the conference. Right. Anyway, I'm done. Does anyone have any other questions for me? What was the biggest takeaway from your trip? I'm curious. Um, I'll talk about that later. Okay. Another time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably the biggest one is that it's doable to go apart. It really it is. And I'm going to lay out, I will lay out the game plan. Um, I have a game plan called um, 10x four, four, four times, like 4x, 10x. Okay. They get the partner. Anyway, I'll talk about that later. So anyway, thanks everybody. Rock on. Tomorrow, builders call. I'm going to unveil this tremendous game plan. I think we'll fire you up. All right, man. Thanks everybody. God bless.